Good evening and welcome to tonight's broadcast. It's the second of the year and we are not wasting any time. Uh, this, I've been saving this one for quite a while now and I'm ready to pull it out and uh, take a look at it, talk about it. We're, we're talking about, we're, go, we're doing a history, a history one tonight. Um, it's history and music combined, actually. That's the best way to describe it yes yes indeed i just realized i can't check i can't check my other stream because of that because of what i just did um all right so we talk a lot of the things that we talk about involve collecting collecting of mainly you know music i don't know just like we talk about collections we talk about pop culture we talk about this we talk about that um one of the things, one of those things is records. We talk about records and, um, uh, you know, there are certain times in history where it was really hard to get them kind of, and <laughs> I'm laughing at myself right now. I'm laughing at myself because I feel like an idiot, but don't worry about it. All right. We're talking about, we're talking about bootleg records from russia how do you think not russia the the soviet ussr i guess to really kind of you know do this the right way we really have to talk about the soviet ussr and i guess we will we'll dive into it but what are what are these things that are known as ribs or bone music or bone records or rib records basically it's also known as music on ribs. Uh, another name is jazz on bones. Um, basically, what they are are records that have been pressed or printed or cut. I guess you would say that they were cut, are cut directly onto x ray film. Um, is that not friggin' incredible? Okay, I'm turning off the Instagram because it's too distracting. I keep looking at it. I don't like it. I, I just, I don't like this. This is not working for me. Yes. End the video. Okay. It's done. It's done. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. That's it. All right. Don't want to see that anymore. Um, they were mostly made. They were mostly made in the fifties, sixties, seventies. Uh, but basically what it is, it's a, it's a black market. You have a black market for music in a place where you know music is incredibly regulated just like a lot of things in the soviet union um you know uh, the artists that were a real commodity were bands you know elvis the rolling stones the beach boys the beatles chubby checker you know popular rock and roll was not appreciated or really allowed and so if you wanted to hear it you had to go about it in this really crazy way and that was that is known that is what is bone music that is what bone music is that was the worst intro of all time thank you i should get man i that like i i deserve like an academy award for how terrible that that intro was it is what it is let's uh let's move on shall we let's move on let's talk about it let's 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 dive in, as the kids always say. Let's dive in. Make sure you smash that subscriber button, like, share, you know, this, that, and the other. Okay, bone music. Here we go. This is from uh, X Ray Audio, which is a a website. I don't know if it's like a website, like a foundation. It's something. It's devoted to the the special history about bone music. Um, <laughs> DLW is here. I haven't seen him in a long time. DL, how are you? You don't talk about X-ray records. X-ray records talk about you. Could you record skulls on an X-ray record about skulls? If so, I want 10. I mean, Glenn Danzig really should get into the uh, X-ray the X-ray record market because he could do it a limited edition of skulls and it would sell like hotcakes. What exactly is bone music? Let's take a look. Uh, so this is not, that doesn't tell you who, who this is written by, but this is from xrayaudio.com. I'll put the link in the chat if you'd like to read along with me or follow along as we as we deep dive on this subject. In the Soviet Union, in the years after the Second World War, a lot of music was banned. 
Almost everything Western was forbidden because the USA and Britain in particular had been seen as the enemy and their culture was held to be harmful. But a lot of Russian music was also forbidden. Anything made by emigrant, emerge, emerges, emigres, emigres. We got to look that up. What does that mean? That is a person who has left their own country in order to settle another. So like an expat, right? Typically for political reasons, though emerge, emerge, whatever, uh, was off limits by definition. Any Russian who had willfully left the country or who had stayed away by choice was now considered a traitor. Uh, whatever their repertoire and, uh, and even if they had previously been approved of, it was not allowed. Uh, some of these people had been huge stars before the war. And what is perhaps most difficult to comprehend is that a lot of domestic music made by Soviet Soviet citizens was also forbidden, or at the very least deemed unofficial. Why was that? And as you can see here, this is what they looked like, man. Look at this. This is an x-ray. And as you can see, there are the grooves right there. And that is, that is an x-ray of somebody's skull. This was not done for design purposes. As a matter of fact, there's a great, there's a Nimvind uh, record that was put out by No Balls, Stefan from No Balls. Shout out to Stefan. Uh, and they kind of did something like this, but I think that was more of a design choice. This is this is done for you know practical reasons, you know, whatever. And but it makes it so much more interesting to listen to bone recordings go here. Okay, we got to do that. We have got to hear what a bone recording sounds like. Uh, go here to see images and sounds of bone disc bone music. Wow. I don't see where it doesn't show me where I can listen to it though. It just says go here if you want to hear it. Um all right, let's not lose focus on the oh here we go. Here here is this is from uh this is farewell so long and goodbye by Bill Haley and his comments. Uh probably shouldn't play that actually. From 1932 and especially during the Stalin era. So so Lenin and his Bolsheviks, they had their revolution. They overthrow Nicholas II, who's the last Tsar of Russia, right? Um, that's the whole reason why my family, at least one side of my family, made it to America. They were uh they escaped the pogroms under Nicholas uh II, the Tsar. And they all like, you know that story, Fievel goes uh, an American tale, Fievel. When Fievel goes to America, when he goes to New York, that is literally the story of my family. We we all had to leave because we were Jews and they were kicking it. Well, not me, my great grandfather, Ben, Ben from us. He was kicked out and he came. He wasn't kicked out. I think he escaped or something. It was something. He smuggled himself, in fact, with his brother, Victor, Victor from us. There you say, if you Google, if you Google from us, you'll find there's like from us jewelry. It was a whole trip. It was a whole thing. They eventually, they ended up in Colorado. Um, in any case, that revolution, which, you know, brought communism with it, uh, you know, was a very strict totalitarian government and society, as we all know. And we know the horrors of communism that, that came with it, right? And it wasn't just, you know... One of the aspects of all the th things that suffered under the, the, the red grip of communism at that time, uh, one of them was culture, you know, especially Western influenced culture and anything, de as he says, as they say above the thing, anything deemed Western was, was persona non grata, man. And then that it became especially true during the Stalin era. So when Lenin died, Stalin took over. And that's when things got their, you know, most, that's what, you know, you always hear about uh, uh, Trotsky getting the ice pick. You know, you know that Strangers, Strangler's song. There's a Strangler song uh, called Whatever Happened to Our Heroes. Whatever Happened to, and it talks about Leon Trotsky, he got an ice pick. That was, that was, I believe that was Stalin. That was, that was Stalin's doing. Um, the ideologues of the Soviet Union believed passionately in culture, but also that art had to be in service of socialist realism and support communist ideals. Now, on the flip side of that, 
This is how you get something called Soviet montage, uh, the Battle of the Potemkin. Um, so there's a lot of like the 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 concept of juxtaposition in film comes specifically from Soviet montage, and uh, as a result of 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 culture needing to reflect social realism, uh, kind of, kind of. Um, and therefore must be subject to an official censor. So you had censors that were deeming what 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 aligned with social with uh social realism and what did not. And uh, you know, that's that's the way it went. Self-expression was out. Many Russian popular tunes, especially from the folk tradition called criminal songs, whilst not really anti-Soviet in themselves, was deemed to be low culture and would not past these conditions many of them were songs that had become popular in the gulags for anybody who knows the gulags that those that's how they exiled you you ever seen mad max beyond thunderdome when he spin he busts the deal so he's got to spin the wheel it lands on gulag which is a what which is what they would do if you were deemed uh what's the word i'm looking for un uh unworthy unfit for society you were exiled you were sent to to, to you know siberia you know, you were sent to work camps where you'd work to death or freeze to death or one of one of the above, exiled from 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 the from society. It's funny how much you know as fa as fascist. You know, fascism is on one side of the spectrum, but on the other side is you know communism, and communism and fascism are actually quite similar. So, in the end of the day, it's all kind of fascist when you really think about it. All of it, all totalitarian government is essentially fascist. It doesn't matter what side you're on. Like a Jacques Burrell, like a Jacques, like a Jacques Burrell track, they might be songs about violence or jealousy or about the rough and tumble of love and lust and life in the camps. A Russian friend said to me recently, remember, at that time, every family had at least one member in the gulag. And even certain rhythms, such as the foxtrot, were banned on the basis that they might lead to wild, licentious, what a word, licentious behavior. What does licentious mean? Licentious, promiscuous, of course, promiscuous and unprincipled in, in certain matters. Uh, licentious behavior, late night gatherings in general, fr frivol frivolity. What does frivolity mean? Boy, they use a lot of $20 words in this one, don't they? Lack of seriousness, lightheartedness. Cool. Um, so it's just more of the same. It's it's rigid fundamentalism of some kind that oppresses culture of create creativity and artistic freedom. That's what it ultimately, that's what ultimately all of this stuff stems from. It's just another. It's the same flavor and a different wrapping, right? The same thing. Uh, but young hearts were, were beating. People had a huge pent-up desire to hear their own music songs, which they had heard in the gulag or sung by those who had returned. Songs which they had loved in previously less controlled times. Songs by artists who were now persona non grata and even perhaps songs that they had heard played by some local singer at a clandestine concert. And of course, there was a demand for the impossibly exotic seeming Western music, the rock and roll or jazz, which might be caught on overseas radio broadcasts. The state hadn't been able to jam. So the state is literally censoring radio waves that are coming into the Russian territories, right? So it's like, I mean, it's like impossible. <laughs> It's like impossible to 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 you know get exposure to any kind of culture. As a result, that doesn't align with social realism. Um. So you have this you have this thirst, this demand for music, right? Uh, so if they they weren't able to jam it, or sometimes these things were heard at a party on gramophone records smuggled into the country by merchant sailors or diplomats. But that's how, you know, that's how a lot of music got around. That's how, that's how the blues, the rhythm and blues got to Britain was because of the sailors at all the port cities and coming into London, coming into Liverpool, right? 
and they bring the R&B records with them, and then all the young British lads, they hear this music, and then it inspires them to make rock and roll, you know? Um, but it's the same everywhere, right? Like, you you know, you, you, you somebody brings records. This was the same thing with, um, I believe it was the same thing with reggae, too. That's how reggae got to Britain. Initially, like ska and reggae music, that was what had happened. Um, I mean, along with the, you know, there were, there were, uh, immig immigrant populations of, of Jamaicans and Caribbeans that were there too, as well. I would imagine that that had something to do with it. Um, such records would be rare and fabulously expensive costing the equivalent of a month's wages. Imagine, imagine paying a month's wages just to have a little culture in your life. Just and you know, think about how important music is, man. We take music for granted today. Think about like a time where like you had to go to extraordinary lengths just to hear something. We really don't understand the, the how ready and available like media is at our fingertips. Like we are so fortunate, so completely fortunate. Um, this combination of of huge demand with restricted supply is, of course the perfect condition for a market to arise, a black market. So, you know, what is that whole, the whole thing, Supp supply and demand, right? You know, if there is uh, a demand, then the supply is going to be worth, worth a pretty penny. Um, and true to form into this market, into this gap between supply and demand stepped the bootleggers. We all know about bootleggers and bootlegs. Uh, we had our own bootleg culture in the West once. Um, I mean, we, there was a variety of bootlegging that's going that went on in the West during the Prohibition era. People wanted alcohol, and the only way that they were going to get it was, you know, illegally by, by way of bootleggers. It's funny the you know Prohibition didn't really stop alcohol it just changed it just changed the the it, it caused the market to evolve you know uh it allowed you know a criminal element to step in and profit instead i mean in this case i don't think this is really criminal what's happening here in soviet russia but um we had our own bootlegging culture in the west once live recordings of concerts by big rock gods made on vinyl or tape in the days before the internet changed everything. That's true because you had the official like discography of a, of a band, but like, man, like, Oh, look, here's a recording of that live show that where they did that, that exceedingly rare live version, like the doors, somebody taped the doors from 1969 doing a 20 minute version of the end that you know the door the doors have never haven't put out a live album yet so here's a live bootleg of the doors doing this thing and we know the beatles are one of the most bootleg bands of all time we're actually going to talk a little bit more about the beatles in a minute as it relates to uh this this these ribs these bone mute the bone music and whatnot um but even if illegal these were relatively easy to make you know making all you just you need a press if you have if you have a lathe and a press you can you can press up your own vinyl the bootleggers first technical pro sorry in the Soviet Union during the period from the late 40s to the early 60s it was not so easy the bootleggers first technical problem that of obtaining a machine to record was relatively straightforward literature existed explaining audio recording techniques stay, uh, say in case a righteous citizen wanted to copy the speeches of comrade stalin and various recording machines had been brought back from Germany as trophies after the Second World War. These could be adapted or copied, but a future problem existed. The state completely controlled the means of manufacturing records. You couldn't just go in and buy the vinyl or the shellac or the lacquer needed in some store somewhere. Because they'd be like, what are you, what is this for? What do you mean? I mean, this is like, you know. I don't want to get into politics, but this is like the extreme. This is the extreme nightmare of when government when government has its overreaches into everything. Now, listen, I'm I like to consider myself, you know, a firm believer of 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 of. Uh, let's ah, fuck. Let's not go into this. I don't want to go into this because 
you can't say anything nuanced these days on the internet. The point being is that, you know, uh, we have, uh, if it wasn't for, uh, government programs, we wouldn't have, uh, fire trucks to, to put out fires when they, when they burn down buildings. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you understand? Like it, the, some, there's some things that are good. There's a, there's a happy medium there. That's what I'm trying to say. But in this case, the, the needle is pushed so far to one side and the government controls everything, literally everything. There's no way to do any sort of creative, independent autonomy in the USSR, right? Unless it's devoted, I'm going to keep saying, I'll just tack that onto every sense, unless it's devoted to Soviet realism. Um, so you, you can't, you don't, you, even if you have a machine to do what you need to do and the machines were, were available, but the, 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 the vinyl, the lacquer, the shellac was not, but at some point, some ent entre ent blah, 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 blah. but at some point, some enterprising music lover hit on a genius idea and you want to know something. This is like the beauty of, to me, I love this kind of tenacity. This is. This is like the perfect synthesis of, of creativity, like unfettered, like raw, pure creativity where, where, where uh, necessity is the mother of invention and gives birth to a uh, uh, beautiful creativity. You know, uh, that's the thing. That's what's so interesting. I'm fascinated fascinated by jail culture me personally i'm fascinated by it why i'm fascinated by jail food jail cuisine because these are people that do not have access to things that they need but they do not let that stop them from attempting to live their lives as if they had them and they find a way to still do it and this is no different and so the idea that some guy, and, and I love that they, nobody, it seems that nobody knows, at least according to this history, because I feel like they would cite the person if they knew who it was, right? Some guy figured out that an alternative source of raw materials was available, used x-ray plates obtained from local hospitals. And this is really where the story begins. For many older people in Russia, remember that. For many older people in Russia, remember seeing and hearing strange vinyl type discs when they were young. The discs had partial images of skeletons on them, and they were called bones or ribs, and they contained wonderful music, music that was forbidden. The practice of copying and recording music onto x rays really got going in St. Petersburg a port where it was easier to obtain illicit records from abroad. So you still needed records. Records had were obviously you needed a record because you had to be able to make a duplicate. But, you know, having one record was precious enough and then being able to make copies on, on X-ray, used X-rays was, a, you know, that was a lot, it was a lot easier. But something that I don't understand, how did someone figure out what, what is it about X-rays? Why X-rays? Is it because it's the material that I guess that they're made out of? They're made out of like some sort of plastic acetate that you can carve a vinyl groove into the, the surface and play back music in the same way that, you know, something that was very popular um, before my time certainly was, was plexi discs, right? Flexi discs, flexi discs, plexi discs and flexi discs. I don't know, you know, where, where you could literally have a, a record in on a postcard or, or pulled out of a magazine, right? That sort of thing. It's, I guess that is the, that's what the philosophy is. And I guess, you know, you could really kind of carve a record out of anything, right? I mean, you have those, you have those like kid, but like Mattel and Barbie, they make records right on the plastic ones. Same kind of trip, right? Same philosophy. Um, it, but it spread first to Moscow and then to most major uh, conur conurbations. I don't know what conurbations means. Let's look it up. Conurbation, an extended urban area, typically consisting of several towns, merged with the suburbs of one or more cities. So it's kind of like a kind of like in Judge Dredd, the mega city, right? Something like that. Uh, major conurbations throughout the states of the Soviet Union. 
Um, wow. And it ends right there. So look, there's a, look at this. Look at these hands, man. Isn't this not like, is this not just so awesome? I mean, this is so frigging cool. Um, there is another here. Let's go to this one now. I oh, know we don't want that one. We want this one. So now, now let's switch over. This is uh, from NPR and it's by NPR staff. And um, this is an interview with a musician uh, that kind of talks about a little bit more on this, uh, this music. I'm not going to, Stephen, I'll just, I'm going to, I'm going to jump into it. I'm not going to go, oh, well, I guess, all right, whatever. Western music may have been changing the world in the 1950s, but if you happen to be in Russia, you were out of luck. State censorship was in full effect in the Soviet Union and sneaking in, say, an American rock record was close to impossible. But a few industrious music fans managed to find another way. Stephen Coates, the leader of a British band called The Real Tuesday Weld, happened on this secret history by accident. Several years ago, on a tour stop in St. Petersburg, he was strolling through a flea market when a strange item caught his eye. I thought, is that a record or is it an x-ray? I picked it up and it seemed to be both, he recounts. The guy who was in whose stall it was was a bit dismissive. I think he wanted me to buy something else because for this British guy was like, was like, I've never seen anything like this. And for the Russian guy, he's like, yeah, this is a very common thing. This is just what, what do you care about this for? It's as common as, you know, toothpicks. Um, but I bought, I brought it back to London and I was fascinated by it. So I started to dig and that led me on a very strange journey. Coates is now an obsessive of what is nicknamed bone music, makeshift LPs etched into used x-rays, which were playable on a turntable and provided a fitting disguise for their contraband contest. Cause you, because it's so flexible and because it's flat, you could roll it up. You could put it in a book. You could, it's easily, it's easy to hide. It's a lot easier to hide than say a, a vinyl disc. He's collected his findings in a new book called X-Ray Audio, The Strange Story of Soviet Music on the Bone. So the website we were just reading from was Coates's website. And he joined NPR's Michael Martin to talk, uh, Mitchell Martin, Michelle Martin, uh, to talk about it. Here uh, is the radio version, the radio version. Blah, 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 blah. Here's some of the conversation below. But before we get there, let's take a quick break to talk about Riot Stickers, the sponsor of this channel. Riot Stickers is where you go for all your vinyl needs. We or sorry, for all your sticker needs printed on vinyl right here. Let me let me hide this for a second. You print printed on vinyl right here. They got a UV coating, UV coating to protect from the sun. What what we're what the deal we're offering now, things have changed, folks. We're no longer doing a uh, thousand stickers for $79. Now, for $69, you can get 200, 200 die-cut stickers. What's the difference between a die-cut sticker and the other stickers? These stickers can have any customized shape that you want. They use a computer-guided scalpel to etch in the same way that they used a lathe to cut into the x-rays for these bootleg bone music records. You can, uh, you, you can have any shape you want for your Riot sticker now. And you can get 200 of those bad boys for $69. That is a fantastic deal for die cut stickers. Very different from the other kind of sticker that we initially were advertising. The link is down below in the description. Go to riotstickers.com backslash from us. Take advantage of this deal now. Let's play the 60 second theme song and we will get back to this mini interview with Coates as we continue to learn about bone music.
All right, we are back. Let's uh, let's hear this little interview here with uh, Stephen Coates as he talks to this NPR dude about um, bone bone music. Uh, Martin says, describe to me what a bone record looks like. Were they cut round like records are? I mean, this is cool too, because I, I know what he's going to say here, but I'll let him say it. Uh, so they would start off with a square or a rectangle X-ray and then probably put a plate on it draw around it with a pen and cut it out by hand. I mean, often the circumference is quite ragged. Yeah. So if you look at some of the pictures, you'll notice that they have, they're, they're kind of, I don't know that they, they have, they're cut. They have, they have like hexagonal sort of uh, circular shapes. Um, it's crazy, dude. It's so great. The innovation, man. Uh, Martin says, how did it occur to you to play the one you found? If you came across a scratched up x-ray in a flea market, I'm not sure that it would occur to me as, uh, to play it as a record. Um, he says, well, the thing is, it looks like a record. If you see these things, they've got a hole in the middle. They've got a groove on them. It's often very faint because it's very shallow. It plays a 78 RPM. That's revolutions per, per minute, per 78 RPM. Is that? What is RPM for that? Revolutions per minute, I guess. Plays at 78 RPM, which was uh, the first thing to find out, and it's only one-sided as well. I found all these things out by discovery and went from there. And you have to imagine this too. Like, you know, how many songs can fit on one of these X-rays, you know? Like the quality of your fidelity of any recording that's going to be on that's going to be on something like that is going to be predicated on how many, how much space, how much, how many grooves you have for the song itself. Not just the, the space between it's not just the space between the grooves, but it's also how much, how much runway you've given allotted to each particular song. So it's like, I could imagine, I mean, in some cases you, if you wanted to play, you know, it's funny. Speaking of No Balls Records, you know what Stefan used to do? He used to do this thing with DVDs. He would actually carve, you could actually carve a single track onto a DVD with a lathe that could be played on a record player. Uh, it was a process. You, you know, it was a, 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 a process that had to be done by hand and it was incredibly time consuming. Um, and I thought that was a trip at the time. I guess you can really put a record onto anything, but imagine if you want to have an album that you have to have like a stack, like of 12 of these x-rays just to play a record, right? You know, assuming, assuming that each one has one song on it, maybe it has more. I don't know. Uh, what can you tell us about how they figured out how to do this and how widespread this practice was? Uh, Coates says what happened was it's 1946 or so. The Second World War is over, but a much colder war has begun, and in the Soviet Union, a lot of culture was subject to censor, whether it be art, paintings, architecture, film. In St. Petersburg, Leningrad, as it was then, a guy turned up and he had a war trophy with him. That war trophy what was, called, was what's called a recording lathe. It's like a gramophone in reverse, a device which you can use to write the grooves of music onto plastic. People who came into his shop observed what he was doing. And as the rush, as is the Russian way, they quote unquote bootlegged his machine and made their own machines. So from one machine, they made more machines so that they could do this. It was a bit like dealing or buying drugs. Actually, these records were bought and sold on street street corners in dark alleyways in the park. We did hear a funny thing, which was that if you asked for a particular song, say rock around the clock and the dealer didn't have it quite often, they would say, yeah, I've got that. And they would go into the corner and write rock around the clock onto one of the other records and give it to you. So there's lots of stories about people buying these records and they may have even, they may not have even known what rock around the clock sounded like. They'd go home and put it on and it could have been anything. And they were like, yeah, that's Bill Haley. He's great. So there's probably a whole slew of disinformation about what is what, because mind you, some of this stuff is in English and this is, this is Russian. Like it, it, there's, there's, there's a, things get lost in translation. It's fascinating, fascinating, fascinating stuff. Um, 
Martin says, listening to some of these, the quality is actually not bad considering how they were made. I mean, and Coates responds, I mean, they do vary in quality hugely. Some were virtually unlistenable, but that didn't seem to matter in some ways. I mean, talking to people who bought these records when they were young, even the tiniest thread of melody of this forbidden sound was so exciting. And it led to a different world, really a world of freedom. Even though the music was not obviously anti-Soviet, you would think, why would the Mambo be regarded as something worth forbidding? By the way, I just want to say his interview is far better than that short history that's on his web website. It, it's so much better. He's so much, he's so much, he's way more well spoken, in, in my opinion. Um Martin says, I was actually thinking that myself. It opens up all kinds of questions about what people think is dangerous, doesn't it? It really does, says Coates. And of course, in some cases, it's obvious. Rock and roll, jazz, the music of America, the music of the UK. But with the other stuff, it got very strange in the Soviet Union. Latin rhythms, the mambo, the tango were forbidden because they were seen as being overtly, overly sensuous if you like, encouraging the wrong sort of passions in young people. I mean, the saxophone became forbidden for a while, but that doesn't really surprise me. Like, for instance, you look at some religious fundamentalists, like, for instance, the Duggars. Do you know who the Duggars are? They're like these religious fundamentalists that believe in a very specific sect of, of, of their own version of Christianity, and they are not allowed to dance. They're not allowed to listen to music, and they're not allowed to dance because they believe that the rhythm that they ex express by dancing is, is influenced by the devil and that it comes out of the music. So they literally think that the devil is corrupting them in this way. So if in that same sort of way, like this does not surprise me at all. If anything, you know, the state is trying to control the people. The state wants to control the people. And part the best way that you can do it is by cutting them off from the world so that they cannot be inspired by what is out there. They cannot be inspired, you know, um, uh, to formulate their own ideas and opinions that may differ from what the state wants them to believe. And that's why it's banned. And that's why it's censored. It's, you know, it's oppression 101 is what it is. That's the truth, man. And so the fact that this music is able to prolifer pro proliferate throughout the country all along, no matter what's happening, you know, we called it the Iron Curtain because we couldn't see through. It was this, uh, you know, we, we didn't know what was going on. And, you know, I took a class on, on in college on, on Soviet, on, on Russian history, including Soviet history. And you know what's amazing? We had, there was so much that we didn't know, at least maybe, maybe our government knew, but, but on the, uh, you know, on a person to person level, there was so much that was a mystery about the other side of the iron curtain. And the truth was, is that they were, you know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was partially part of the reason why it collapsed is because they never industrialized. They never, um, they, they relied on manpower for everything. And that was something that was like a pre-World War II notion and post, you know, you know, modern, I mean, industrialization goes back to the 19th century, but what, you know, in terms of like modern industrialization, the, the Soviets, they never went through it the way the, the Western world did and they collapsed and capitalism ended up being the winner in the, in the cold, in the cold war ultimately. Right. Um, but part of, part of what their, their, their means of control, it's just like, it's like, we can't let you see the other side. You know, you would want that, you know, you want that you don't want, you wouldn't want to stay with us and what we're up to. I mean, it's really crazy stuff. When you consider the stranglehold that, that communism, that totalitarian communism, communist governments had, you know, you know, we, I, I, including myself, I, there's so much I hate about America. There's a lot of stuff that really upsets me and disappoints me out of America. Believe me, I can, I could, I could fill up five podcasts about my disdain for so many things in, in regards to America. But there's one thing that's kind of amazing. It's amazing to me. Like we don't re I don't think we realize how much freedom we have compared to some other people in different po points and times of history. 
I mean, the fact that the internet is free to us, that information is free to us. I mean, there was a time where people could not get, people could not fucking hear a Beatles song. They couldn't fucking turn on a radio and hear Hey Jude playing. That's so crazy. That's so crazy. As a musician yourself, says Martin, this must have made you think about just how important music is to people and that they would go to such lengths to hear it. Coates says, for me, the thing that's really poignant is that some of these people went to prison for doing this. They were punished quite severely for it. This was a time when music mattered so much that people would risk public censor. They would risk imprisonment. We live in a time where... It... <laughs> he literally says... The... <laughs> we live where I'm, I'm on the parallel, parallel wavelength. We live in a time where you can get anything you want immediately. Music is abundant, and that's great, of course. But I wonder... As somebody who makes music, how much does music matter now? And now, you know, band when bands are are not a dime a dozen, they're a hundred to to a fraction of a penny. There's an oversaturation of it now. You know, uh, does it matter as much as it used to? I mean, I don't think it. I don't think it will ever not matter. I mean, music is one of the most important things in the world. All of media, media is culture, man. And culture is the spice of fucking life, isn't it? Um, this was a time when it mattered immensely. And that's food for thought for all of us, I think. Um, man, that is that is something else. Um, the next thing I'm going to share with you. Chris says, I've seen some of these made in East Germany. That's really cool. Um the next thing I want to look at here quickly is um, specifically the Beatles, uh, the, the Beatles bootlegs that were the, the, my, my previous knowledge of bone music comes from the fact that, you know, as, as an avid passionate scholar of the Beatles and the Beatles history, that, you know, the way that Russians were able to hear the way that Soviets were able to hear Beatles music was on these x-rays. So I didn't know anything about it other than that it was somehow on x-rays. And that was my, the extent of knowledge. So I've learned all this stuff since now here. Um, one of our favorite Beatles websites, this is from this is from the Beatles blog. It does not say who the author is. One of our favorite Beatles websites, the Beatles get back in the USSR, um, one of our favorite Beatles websites is the Beatles get back in the USSR, mostly because it's a treasure trove of information over every aspect of Beatle collecting in Russia, but also because it is clearly a labor of love and a remarkable resource. The level of research scholarship and the effort that's been put into the site is immediately obvious. Not to mention that the amazing and extensive image libraries accompanying each topic that is that, that that is written about. If, for example, you intersect in all the different pressings and versions of Paul McCartney's Russian album, uh, first issue on the Melodia uh, label in 1988, then you can't get past this site's chapters on it here, here, and here. I don't, I don't know this. Web pages for a chapter called "Illegal and Semi-Legal Beatles Releases in the USSR." are the result of more than 10 years of work to find recordings, images, and information and to analyze and describe all the content. And it tells an extraordinary tale. Um, these illegal and semi-illegal and semi-legal releases bear witness to the extraordinary lengths people in the Cold War Russia went to hear and share Western music, especially rock and roll and, of course, Beatles music. Right through the 60s and well into the 70s, there were practically zero officially released Beatles records issued in Russia. So, again, there's a need for a market, and here it is. Hey, Aaron, how are you? Happy New Year to you. Um, rock music was considered decadent and not suitable for the masses, so the people took matters into their own hands. Uh, using smuggled in originals from England and Europe, they made their own unofficial copies of songs the only ways they knew how. Now, here's why I wanted to bring this because we've heard all this information thus far in the episode. So, in addition to doing it 
uh, to the X-ray process. There was another process. There were two main processes. The first was to utilize the many small commercial recording booths that were dotted around the Russian cities and towns. These were set up to record short audio postcards. So an audio postcard, just like you get a postcard in the mail. You know what a postcard is? Like here, pretend, let's pretend, we'll use this as a prop. Pretend here's our postcard, right? And etched right onto the postcard is an audio play, a playable audio message that you could literally play with, on your turntable with a needle, right? Uh, these were set up to record short audio postcards that could be sent through the post. This was, back in the day, a popular way of sending loved ones a message along with a photograph of the place or holiday location you'd been visiting. They look something like this. So here's an example of what one looks like. Very interesting. Uh, did I just, what did I just do? Can I go back there? There we go. Um, and here's another one right here. The postcard record above is likely a one-sided flexi disc with a message recorded on the picture side. But this particular example contains a recording of rollover Beethoven from the Beatles. Um, these postcard flexies played at 78 RPM and only contained enough space for one song. So not the x-rays, but for the postcards, you could only get one song if you were lucky, but you got to hear the Beatles in a country that didn't allow you to freely listen to them. Look at that. That is just, that, that blows my friggin' mind. How special. The postcard record, oh, no, we already read that. The other means, and this is the one we've talked about, the other means of copying and distributing was through uh, home tinkerers who set up illegal recording lathes to cut Beatles songs directly onto medical x-rays. Yes, medical x-rays. These became known as music on bones or music on ribs for obvious reasons. So here they are. Uh, these freaky looking x-rays above have a Beatles song cut into them. So it's one Beatles song that can be played on a turntable. They say that necessity is the mother of invention and these thick, oh, so it's made out of celluloid. Celluloid sheets of x-ray film, right, of course, because it's film, were one of the few resources available to people in the Soviet Russia at the time. Like the postcards, these music on bones play also played at 78 RPM. And to be honest, our ear to our ears now to our ears now they don't sound great. But this was the only way that anyone was going to be able to hear this type of music at that time. And don't forget making them and owning them owning recordings like these could get you into big trouble with the authorities some ended up in prison just because they like to listen to rock and roll um so this is a fascinating history and you could spend quite a while on their site uh discovering a lot more about this little known avenue of beatles collecting shout out to audrey and our old friend Be yeah very cool very freaking cool and here's a documentary about it there's a documentary i'm not here Let's go to, all right, so check this out. Wow. All right, so this is in English. This is in English and in Russian. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but look at that. That's Those are the places, and that's how people would listen to music. I, I just, I'm so, I'm so blown away by this. It really deserves its own kind of documentary. This right here is a flexible photo record. Huh. Just just outrageous, man. Look at that. That's a Beatles one. So that's how they sometimes that's how they would look right there. Isn't that cool? Can you see it? Yeah, you can see that. That's amazing. That I mean, that's for some people, that's how they found the Beatles. That was the only way that they heard the Beatles. You have to imagine, like, oh God, it's so fucking cool. Look. I'm not going to play it, but here, let's see. The, the, here it is being played. Look at this. Look at that. Look at that thing. Isn't that amazing? And you need nickels to weigh it down. Look at, look at how wobbly it is, man. And that's how people heard the Beatles. One song. And you got to imagine those things wear out so quickly, right? Like the, the, that, that doesn't last. Oh, is that special? That is, that is something else, man. That is really something else. I, I am amazed by that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in such awe. I'm in such awe of this. What an incredible website this is. 
Um, the last we'll look at before we go. Here's the last, the last piece. So this is from that blog from that from Coates's website, and this is Slava's story. I have recently been in dialogue with Slava, uh, a Ukrainian whose father and why a Ukrainian. We were just talking about Russian. Well, that's a whole other complicated story. Um, as you know, a Ukrainian whose father built himself a recording lathe to cut x-ray records in the 1960s. Below is Slava's story together with a film he made of his father's beautiful machine in action, an absolute perfect tutorial of how to cut bone music. I lived in the village of a name that I am not going to try and describe near another village that I'm not going to try to describe in the region of Ukraine. My father was born in 1938 and lived here all his life and worked as a precision machinist in a factory. He had a hobby of radio electronics and engineering. And in 1961, when he was 23, he made an apparatus for making records on x-rays, a recording lathe. It has two motors, an arm with a thread and a recording head with a cutting needle. I still have some needles. They look like they have diamond heads, possibly sapphire, and they are homemade ones made out of metal. Uh, the turntable rotates at 78 RPM. The case is homemade, made by my grandfather, who was a carpenter. My father made many records on the x-ray with his handmade machine. Maybe some residents of the village still have records that he wrote. The machine is in excellent condition and has always been kept in our house. We treat these things with extreme care. This is a memory. At first, father recorded music from the radio that he began to seek out music that was forbidden and played the radio at night by so-called radio hooligans, people who made homemade radio transmitters and were broadcasting illegally on the short wave. I had been fond of radio electronics since childhood and was always interested in such things. So my father showed me how it was done and told me how it was. It used to be in the old days when a lot of music was banned and they could put you in jail for recording. You had to record in secret. He didn't do it for money, but for pleasure. Before he and my mother were married, he would make records for her and for her friends. School children would come before the holidays in order to make greetings for their teachers on a record. What a service this guy provided. First, he would wash the surface of the x-ray film with acid to remove the image of bones and then glue a picture or a photo that the child had brought with them under the film and punched a hole in the center for the spindle. People like my father recorded either straight to x-ray film for or first on a tape recorder and then copied it onto the x-ray note this is how sound letters were made in those days there was a shortage of tape on the tape recorder so he made a lot of records for people in a department store and they gave him reels of tape i started working with him at age eight and we made several records together he liked the song i mean this is like to me this this is what should be um this is the type of thing that this is a movie like this. Th this deserves its own movie. What what a beautiful story. Um, oh, my God. He liked the songs of a person who I'm not going to try and whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce um, like Mishka or the Black Cat and some foreign songs. I don't remember which forbidden songs we recorded, but I was born in 1970. So I was interested to record new music. We recorded with a tape recorder, and then I made it into a record with his machine. So here is, I'm just going to, so look, there's the machine. There's a record. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Look what he's doing. Cutting it up. I mean, think about all the cool designs you could make. Think about all the cool limited edition. I mean, I guess anybody who who grew up in the 80s or 70s rolls their eyes at me because they go, yeah, they were called plexi discs, flexi discs, and we had them all the time. I mean, it's not, it's not an uncommon thing, but it's sure as shit uncommon now. Look at that. So he's cutting it to size first, and now he's going to put it on the machine. What a special connection he must have. And shame on uh, Coates for filming this vertically instead of horizontally. I mean, come on, dude. Look, he's putting it on, and then he can he can he can carve in. Look at that! What an extraordinary machine, man. 
I'm like, I'm like emotional just looking at it. That is beautiful. Now it's cutting the music. As you can see. Look at that. Straight from his uh straight from his uh phone. He has the freedom to do that now. That that machine transcends a time where look at that. How 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 beautiful is that, man? I don't know. It looks like some gunk has gotten caught in the needle where where the the groove is being made and he's got to scrape it away maybe i don't know oh am i fascinated by this i'm so fascinated by the process and now he's playing it on a record player how cool beautiful man beautiful 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 um Slava went on to tell me more about radio hooligans. We have written about these intrepid souls before. I'm not going to read that. These so, but here's some excerpts. The so-called radio hooligans were young people who broadcast on the radio without permission. I would tune into such broadcasts. I remember listening to music they played and heard them talking. They joked about what kind of music they would play, and they paid for it. Some were put in jail. Most of these hooligans are no longer alive, but what fucking heroes, man. Um. The one, Vasily, Vasily, a friend of my father, also lives in our village. He is now a legitimate radio amateur, but very old and probably doesn't go on air now that there is a war. That's so sad. He had a very funny story about broadcasting songs in the air. Patrols had been created to catch such radio hooligans. They, drive, they drove through the streets of the village in special cars equipped with a receiver uh, to track the house from which the transmission was being made. Vasily had who had uh, a call sign, uh, I guess, like kind of like a DJ name, uh, Sl Sl Slokia, was broadcasting songs and saw through the window that the patrol was entering his yard. He quickly disconnected the transmitter from the radio and he threw it into a pot of borscht, which his wife was cooking on the stove. The patrol came in, searched the entire house, but no one thought to look in the pot on the hot stove. Thank you so much, Slava. It's absolutely wonderful to hear your story. And then there's a gallery of the images. We saw that stuff already. I mean, that's and that's it, man. That's it. That's that's the whole thing. Absolutely, um, uh, absolutely uh, terrific story. Um, be just beautiful, man. Absolutely beautiful. Love it. Love it. Um, that's all I got for you tonight. Uh, we'll be back soon with more stuff. Whenever, whenever, because I do it whenever, whenever. Um, trying to get a kiss show together with some with some panelists. That's that's something else that's coming up. I didn't mention that in my New Year's. Did I broadcast? Yes, no, I broadcasted. Yeah, early in the morning. It feels that already feels like it was three days ago. New Year's feels like it was three days ago. It was freaking yesterday. I mean, my God, my God. All right. In any case, peace, hair grease. You know the rest. We'll see. Uh, we'll see you 